Well, I'm, uh, I'm just going to read a few things that I put together, and I, I feel like uh, Colonel Lincoln Hooker stole half of my, my speech here. Um, so just bear with me if I repeat some of the stuff he did. But I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, it's a special occasion, um, not only for me, but for my family. Um, it's only the second time my family um, has been able to see me receive an award outside of my retirement ceremony. Um, if I had one wish, though, uh, it would be that my dad could be here uh, to share this moment with me. He was a fellow veteran, and he was a lifetime member of the VFW. Um, I want to thank Colonel Paul Lincoln Hoker uh, for today's award presentation and gathering veterans from VFW Post 1033 to participate. Please give them a round of applause. Um, today's a special day for me for a couple of reasons. Um, First, this marks uh, the end of a nearly eight-year paperwork chase uh, to get to where we are today. Um, if any of you know how the military handles paperwork, um, you'll know that it can be a very cumbersome process. Uh, secondly, um, after two years of being retired from the Army, I can still fit my dress uniform. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, Many of you know um, that we have our very own retired Colonel here on staff at Boys Hall, um, but I've only known him for about two years. Uh, so I decided to ask Colonel Lincoln Hoker uh, to do the honors for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, me and Colonel Lincoln Hoker have known each other for about 30 years now. Um, when I first met him, uh, I knew him as Mr. Lincoln Hoker, the principal of Callahan. Um, and we had a very close relationship during my time at Callahan, which neither of us, I think, enjoyed very much. Um, you see, I was a bit of a behavioral menace to society in my early years. Uh, required a lot of... Uh, certain level of engagement at the higher levels of administration. Um, this is also true of my time here on the Hill with Mr. Wheatley. <clears throat> so, um, Mr. Lincoln Hooker moved a desk into his office and put a spare set of my classroom books in there so that he can continue, so I could continue to learn while he grilled me on why I did something I wasn't supposed to do. Um, this led to the second reason why I chose him for today's ceremony. Um, during the school year here at Boys Home, our leadership class recites a quote of the day every day during lunch. And shortly after receiving my Purple Heart in the mail, I was reminded of Mr. Lincoln Hoker after hearing this quote. The roots of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. Now this can be interpreted in many ways, um, but the time and effort our educators and staff put into teaching, coaching, and mentoring the youth of today can be an arduous process. But when the seeds grow and blossoms into something extraordinary, it makes all the time and effort worth it. Mr. Lincoln Hoker, I hope that's how you feel today. See, the Purple Heart was created in 1782 by George Washington to recognize soldiers for meritorious service or bravery in combat. It wasn't until 1942 that the award was designated specifically for wounds received in combat at the hands of the enemy. Unlike most military awards, which are presented for meritorious service or significant accomplishments and achievements, the Purple Heart is awarded for sacrifice. Sacrifice of physical well-being in pursuit of mission accomplishment. All Purple Heart recipients sacrifice physical well-being, but all combat veterans sacrifice mental and emotional well-being for their country, their mission, and their battle buddies to their left and right. Not all Purple Heart recipients live to tell their story of sacrifice. The two gentlemen on the memorial by the flagpole are two that didn't get to tell their story. Specialist Norman Miller and Corporal Michael Folland, Boys Home alums and recipients of the Purple Heart who gave their life in service to our country. Specialist Miller received the Army Commendation Medal with a Valor device for his bravery and sacrifice on the battlefield. Corporal Folland received the Purple Heart for jumping on a grenade to save his platoon from certain death. Corporal Folland went on to receive the highest military honor for bravery and valor, the Congressional Medal of Honor. These two gentlemen are extraordinary examples of heroes on the battlefield and were awarded posthumously for their efforts. Not all heroes are recognized with a medal for their efforts. <clears throat> Many heroes are recognized and revered by those around them. Their willingness to act in the face of adversity has somehow impacted their lives forever. And I want to talk about a couple of those today, very briefly, because it's warm out here. All right. On the 7th of April, 2011, it's a day that I'll never forget. Last year during our training session, I spoke of a story in Afghanistan, and this one is a little bit different. 
I was assigned to the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, as a platoon sergeant, waiting for a helicopter on Forward Operating Base Walton in Kandahar Province, Afghanistan. A complex attack that began around 9 a.m. with a volley of AK-47 rounds ricocheting off the vehicles just yards from where we stood, ended with 11 RPG rounds that hit inside our walls, five insurgents wearing suicide vests attempting to breach our gate, three vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, basically three vehicles rigged with explosives, that all attempted to breach the gate. After all the fire had begun to die down and casualties were being treated, an ambulance carrying three insurgents with suicide vests were let through our security forces to render medical evacuation. It turned out that the vehicle was rigged with explosives that eventually killed 15 of our Afghan National Police Forces men in the gate. What seemed like only 30 minutes of action turned out to be nearly three hours of chaos. One of the heroes that day was Corporal Vasquez, a light wheel mechanic manning the Southeast Tower. When RPGs began to fly, he was unable to get a lock on the insurgent across the street. He decided to climb along the top of the HESCO barrier wall until he was exposed to enemy RPG and AK-47 fire. He took aim with his M4 rifle and neutralized the insurgent, which ended the RPG fire. He received an Army Commendation Medal with a Valor device for that. During that time, my doc, Captain Eigel, had been hit with shrapnel from an RPG, and my senior medic, Sergeant Archuleta, blew his eardrums and suffered a traumatic brain injury. Our doc was trying to render aid to others wounded when he became pale, diaphoretic, and was unable to stand. Sergeant Manley ran from the bunker to the aid station, exposing himself so he could get pain meds and supplies for our doc and others wounded in the bunker. Once the RPG fire stopped, the medics were able to get everyone into the aid station and begin treatment. Sergeant Archuleta, although wounded, coordinated and helped treat 12 casualties. Our medevac helicopter was in a holding pattern because the FOB was still under fire. Our close air support attack helicopters were circling overhead, unable to fire on targets because of the marketplace with civilians across the street. Sergeant Manley volunteered, along with Sergeant Phipps, to establish a medevac holding and treatment area in an adjacent building. This allowed us to stabilize patients and open our three trauma litters for the remaining casualties. We continued to see patients long into the night, conducting over 50 military acute concussion exams or MACE exams. We medevac eight casualties, and that day, every single person that came through that aid station lived to see another day. As a platoon sergeant, I'm proud to say that those were my medics. I like to think that my leadership and training is why they were able to perform so flawlessly. But that statement is only partially true. You see, I was assigned to the unit in April of 2010 and deployed only five weeks after arriving to Fort Carson as part of the torch party. The medics I inherited were trained by two of my battle buddies, non-commissioned officers that I consider my friends. Sergeant First Class Greta, Greta Gotro and Sergeant First Class Taylor LeBlanc. My wounds aren't flashy and I don't bear a visible scar for all the world to see. Like many others, my wounds are invisible to the world around me, but equally and sometimes more debilitating. I blew my eardrums that day and I suffered a traumatic brain injury, leaving a four by nine millimeter lesion on the right frontal lobe of my brain. <clears throat> I went through 10 months of rehabilitation at Fort Belvoir's National Intrepid Center of Excellence for Traumatic Brain Injuries. And to this day, there are things that I either can't do or I have to put in significant effort to do that were once second nature. That's just a reality that I'll have to work on and live with for the rest of my life. Despite all of this, I had the honor of serving alongside some great men and women in the United States Armed Forces, which is something I wouldn't trade for the world. They showed me that not all heroes wear capes. Not all heroes are recognized and rewarded equally, but most importantly, they showed me that no recognition, no adversity, and no circumstances will ever stand in the way of them fulfilling the oath they swore to uphold. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again uh, for sharing this special occasion with me and my family. Thank you again to VFW Post 1033 for all you've done for our country and for what you continue to do for veterans. Ladies and gentlemen, let's eat. Thank <laughs> you.